All right. Hey, guys. Welcome back to Floating City Podcast. Um, this is a podcast where I interview people that I find very inspiring that start a business and or art, like some sort of artistic craft or a little bit of both. And we kind of break down their mindset and how they got to this point, all that kind of stuff. So anyways, today I have Miss Rowe with um, the kimchi, oh my Lord, um, Lady Pirate. So how, how do you call, what, what is the business name, official business name? Lady Pirate Products. Just Lady Pirate. Yeah, but I go, I go by Lady Pirate, yeah. Okay, awesome, sweet. Well, hello, Miss Rowe. <laughs> um, so um, I, am super into fermented foods i'm like kind of a health nut and um so how did you how did you hear about like how where did you start with the fermented foods thing did you kind of just like the product and start getting into that and then that started or were you into it already before so um i've been cooking professionally for 15 16 years and uh i've always been really into older rustic methods of cooking and preserving foods and things like that. And um, I was introduced to it through one of my jobs that I had in the kitchen. And uh, I slowly just started playing around with it on my own time and eventually uh, brought it onto menus at kitchens I was running. And uh, I got really into kimchi and it took about almost two years to get my kimchi recipe down. And that was way before I had even thought about you know, putting it out into the world. Mm -hmm. So um, my wife actually was the one that was like, you need to try and sell this. So I decided to just uh, do the farmer's market once a week on one of my days off and just see what happens and without really any expectations, you know? Very cool. Okay, nice. Yeah, so we met actually through, this is like kind of a common theme amongst the podcasts. I met um, meet the guests uh, at the my workplace, which is Regulars Wanted here in Julian. So we met through there and we started selling your kimchi there. And like right now it's flying off the shelves. Like it's, it's going, I mean, I'm also, you know, and the people that tried it and are working there promote it as well, but it's flying off the shelves. It's an excellent product for people that like kimchi. It is, or people that for, for me, I've tried kimchi before. I don't like fishy, like fermented stuff. I, it didn't sound good to me, like when I start, like before I even tried it. But I have, I had the jar in my room. I already finished like more than two thirds of the jar because flavor, amazing, you know. And wait, can you buy this stuff online? Yes. Okay. So you can buy this online. It's yeah. worth it. And it's really for, uh, truly fermented. You know, like when I opened it up, it was like, and are you know bubbling so it's like a really high quality product um so yeah so yeah we met through regs and um I've, i'm already on jar number two so i've and people all over town have been raving for it so product wise it's like it sells itself so awesome job on that um so um so do you the, the fermented aspect of it mm -hmm. like did is that like the health aspect of it are you into or was it just mostly like um how do I explain, how do I ask this question right? Like, is it, is it the health product or is it the taste? What, what did you, what called you more to it? So I grew up uh, in Spain and in California. So I was really introduced to different preserved and pickled things and like that kind of flavor profile. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love it. So I've always liked kimchi uh, to start with that. Um, mm -hmm. But really it was about the science part of it and from like being a chef and culinarian being fascinated with being able to take something in its raw state and make it into this like even more raw state mm -hmm. but elevated and enhanced and make it taste really good so back to what you were saying about how you know normally you're not really into the fishy thing my whole mission with it um obviously it's good for you. Obviously there's all these benefits and I started enjoying the benefits too. I started noticing differences in, in different aspects, you know, of my health. Um, but my whole mission with it is to come from a chef's perspective and make it taste good because a lot of people have had the experience that you've had, which is a bad experience. They, they don't want to eat it. They think it's rotten food. They think it's weird and fishy and that's not what it is at all. So 
Um, I want flavor first and the benefits obviously are already there. Nice. Yeah. And I like, I like with the podcast, it's like, I, like I said before, it's like business owner or like a artist, I really consider fermenting food, fermented foods in art form for sure. I mean, just like culinary art, but that's like a whole genre in itself. <laughs> it, it's science. Yep. It's science. You're playing with science. Totally. And, and so cooking is playing with science, but this is like, you know, another level. Totally. And do you, um, so what else, other than kimchi, what else do you guys offer? Uh, so we offer a sauerkraut. Um, we offer a couple different kinds of pickles. And we also offer a kimchi sauce, which is derived from our kimchi. And uh, as a chef, it over time is ingrained in you that you must minimize waste as much as possible. So it's my way of you know not throwing away product and making sure that I stretch it as much as possible in terms of you know just not throwing food away mm-hmm. um, and it's this beautiful pro just probiotic rich sauce that's left over after the kimchi is made that's just full of flavor that people use as like a mild hot sauce they use it to marinate things in like it's so versatile I've, I have people make putting them in co- putting it in cocktails and people get crazy with this stuff so we have a lot of fun with it and that's our that's our main five products and then I'm always doing R&D on the side. R&D what's that? Just research development. I'm um, always playing around with stuff, you know, I've I've got I always have weird experiments happening just to see what I can come up with next because along with wanting the flavor first to be there and coming from like the chef's perspective, I want it to be interesting things that I would normally create on a menu for just a dish if I was mm-hmm. you know in a restaurant still so I want people to to learn how to eat fermented foods every day yep in different ways instead of it only you know people only eating kimchi with Asian dishes mm-hmm. or sauerkraut with a hot dog or something you know like I want people to really use it as an ingredient that they can use in any dish any oh. time of the day Nice. Yeah. Cause most of the sauerkraut and like, um, like pickled stuff, it's all with vinegar. It's not, most of it's not like the living, like just salt fermented foods. So I really like that. That's um, something you guys specialize in is just that specifically. So it's you that makes most of the product then. I do. I make all the product. Yeah. Oh, all the products. Okay. Nice. Very cool. And like, so what other stuff do you like experiment? What have you been experimenting with recently? Well, something uh, that I hope to release soon here um, it are they're lacto fermented taco shot pickles. So I don't know if you from the salsa bar at, ta- at Taquerias they have like the carrots and the jalapenos and the onions mm-hmm. that are pickled. So I have a product. Um, I'm actually just figuring out a name for it right now. Um, that's lacto-fermented uh, carrots, jalapenos, radishes, some garlic and onions. And it's just this like awesome, just it's so refreshing and spicy and crunchy and it's great to put on tacos or, you know, anything really, just eat it as a snack. Very cool. And so you got the five products now. That's so awesome. I really like that um, that you guys are doing that. And, and how, how long have you been in business for right now? Since 2019. 2019 so one year yeah and you guys are pretty all you know it's it's been growing pretty well I'm assuming yeah yeah I mean we went from one day a week at the farmer's market to four farmer's markets a week you know and doing deliveries every week throughout San Diego Julian wherever Mm -hmm. Uh, and we ship nationwide as well as well so cool and so you have you you've been marketing a lot of it on social media like Instagram is how Jen figured out about you guys right you reach out to her all Instagram nice so and so all all of your marketing you've been doing through Instagram you're saying yeah yeah very cool like yeah social media marketing is like like the way of doing it nowadays and yeah. so you just mostly um just straight up DM people um yeah depending on you know what we're doing, but it's been a lot of just roots growth, you know, just people knowing about us in locally in the community, you know, through farmers markets. Um, I think in the beginning, I had a little bit of luck with it because I do have, I have a community here just in the 
restaurant industry too. So a lot of people know of me already. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a steady growth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very cool. Love um, social media marketing. I do some of that at Regulars Wanted too. So I'm always really interested in that. Um, so through community, that's, that's so awesome. And you're, um, do you, is this like your full-time thing or you um, also work as a chef still? It's my full-time thing. Nice. And it took, it took a year to get to that point. Well, I was still running a kitchen um, here in San Diego and right before COVID hit actually, uh, like I told you in the uh, earlier, I have family in Spain. So my grandmother actually passed away and I went there for the funeral in February of last year, right before everything got shut down here. Um, and that experience just kind of put a lot of things in perspective for me as to, you know, what I'm doing with my time uh, and how I wanted to do something that mattered that wasn't what I was doing at the time. Uh, I, I basically, I from dishwashing all the way to executive chef, I had climbed the ladder in the culinary field in San Diego. Um, and then once COVID hit, I got, I almost actually got stuck in Spain when they shut down with everything because they shut down before and then I got back and then a week later the restaurant I was working at shut down wow. so I parted ways with them and decided to take this opportunity because I know last year was very difficult for a lot of people and businesses you know everything really was affected um, but it was a really big opportunity for me to take a chance and go run with it because I have nothing to lose you know yes <laughs> wow, so cool. And um, and you've been in the culinary, when did you start, like, you know, when did you start dishwashing, like, that beginning of that whole climb? How uh, around, like, 14, 15 years old. Wow. Yeah. And you grew up in Spain, or you grew up here? Both. So oh. my mom is from Spain. So my sister, my brother, I have a lot of family that live there. They all live there currently. Uh, my dad's from California. So, uh, growing up, once they had separated, it was like, go to my mom's for a year in Spain and then come back. I, I mostly live in California, but I was always going back over there. Oh, okay. Cool, cool. And um, you started, and when did you realize, is it like, is it in your family? Like, does your people in your family into cooking or was this just kind of your thing? No, uh, everybody cooked. I mean, my grandmother on my dad's side is a great cook. She's, uh, her family's from Italy and, you know, the, the Italian side. And uh, my mom is a fantastic cook. Everybody in Spain knows how to cook and it's just ingrained in them. So I, I was lucky that I got to grow up around a lot of people, always around food. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that was something that really called me to being in the culinary field because I wanted to provide a space for people to just come together, you know, have good food, have good drink, have a good conversation and just, you know, build community that way. Wow, very cool. So you knew that, like, see, once you started dishwashing, you kind of already knew you were gonna be a cook. Yeah, well, I, uh, I started at a cheese shop, a cheese and wine shop and cafe. So I actually started making soups and salads and sandwiches and stuff for um, art students that were in an art college nearby. Mm -hmm. And um, then soon started learning all about cheese. And it was kind of like trying to be a cheesemonger at 15, like <laughs> just, just like slinging cheese in the cafe. And then at nighttime, they had a culinary school next door that was connected through the business. So I would dishwash during the classes to you know, sit in on the class. Um, and then I basically worked there throughout high school and then went to culinary school right after in New York and then um, came back and then just started, you know, grinding and working my way up and moving around. Very nice. So how, for people that want to get into cooking, do you feel like culinary school is necessary for that? Or yeah, what do you think about that? Because I know you went to it, obviously. So what, what is your perspective on it? Um, depending on what the person wants to do and where they're at in their life, mm -hmm. 
um, I would say don't go. Actually, oh. don't go. Dang, okay. Well, yeah. I mean, I yeah. became very trendy. Mm -hmm. uh, and like when I went to culinary school, I went right out of high school and a lot of people went right out of high school because they thought that they were going to be this food network chef. And that's not reality at all. Mm -hmm. You're better off starting off as a dishwasher if you have zero experience for a short amount of time and getting your way into the kitchen by asking to help being that person that's always like, hey, what can I do? What can I do? And, you know, that's what the kitchen environment is. is it's a it's camaraderie and it's teamwork and uh, it's really hard work. So, you know, it's not the highest paying industry either. So culinary school is very expensive. So when you get out of culinary school, you are going to go into a kitchen where it may not pay you well. And you also have to pay your culinary school fees. So I would suggest after 15, 16 years of experience, don't go to culinary school. Just know what you want and start somewhere and just. Oh, I lost you. I, I, uh oh, can you say that again? So um, start off um, with culinary school, know what you want. Sorry, because I lost you for a sec. Oh, that's OK. Um, don't go to culinary school, just get into a kitchen that you like. If it's, if you're really into a certain type of cuisine that you're interested in, go and work in a restaurant that's like that. It doesn't matter how fancy or not it is. You just need to have some experience under your belt and then you can kind of navigate the waters from there, you know? And being in a kitchen, you meet people and you can uh, network so much more than you would be able to do in culinary school because everybody's, you know, a newbie and they don't know what's going on. Totally. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear the same thing. It's half and half, you know, some people really suggest culinary school, some people don't. And then like, same thing with artists, there some really recommend art school and then some people are like against art school. And same with filmmakers, like film school, some of them say like literally just go make a movie, spend the money that you would make on a movie. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> before there was, before, whatever industry it is had you know schools for those things people mm -hmm. just figured it out but I think if you if you have the money to spend and you want to take the time to do that it's not going to hurt you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it will benefit you because it it's college college gives you foundations for things but it doesn't actually teach you any kind of experience they just give you this toolbox and then they you go out in the world and you figure it out but in the kitchen, because of what it is, and maybe the same with film or, or art, you just have to get your hands dirty with it. And that's how you gain experience. You yeah, know? meet other filmmakers. I need to learn how to chop an onion. Good point. Yeah, you could do all of it at home. Yeah, that's a really good point. YouTube. YouTube, it's YouTube University. <laughs> yeah, I call it that too. <laughs> nice, nice. Is there any, um, like, TV personalities or like specific um, like people that you're inspired by, like cook wise, like culinary artist wise? I love Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain. Uh, he, I mean, even when he got a little big and uh, was doing his shows like that, he's great. Mm -hmm. Really humble and yeah. 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 Um, other than that, I mean, honestly, I don't enjoy watching cook shows. Uh, it's, I think I could probably do it now that I'm not in the kitchen and it's been a year, which has been very weird for me to adjust to. Um, but beforehand, I, I can't, I can't watch cook shows. It's, it's too much. Like, why would I want to go back into a stress environment and watch it happen? Or I just want to yell at the person who's doing something wrong. Good, good point. Yeah. Like, so you don't like, like the, like Gordon Ramsay, for example? Um, yeah, he's entertaining, but I mean, if you, I am someone who I read a lot, so I know about his background. I know who his mentor chef was, you know, I know a lot about that stuff and you, that world's, in, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. It used to be really crazy. And mm -hmm. it's going through this, um, uh, phase right now where 
that craziness isn't allowed anymore. You totally. can't throw pans of risotto at cooks anymore. You can't throw cheese at people anymore. Like, you know what I mean? Totally. It's a, it's a very crazy industry. Totally. Yeah. Even at the restaurant at regulars right now, what they, they specifically mentioned Jen and Christian were talking about how like, that's like such a, like the pissed off chef in the kitchen, like throwing stuff. And that's like very old school. And like the new way of doing it is balanced, patient, you know, putting love into the food rather than like getting it out and making it look, you know, <laughs> that whole. Yeah. I mean, I grew up with, I grew up, my experience had both. My experience had a very balanced calm respectful chef and then I've also had a chef where you know I punched him in the face because he because we got into it you know what I mean Whoa. and it's another level also it might not be the same anymore but for a, a woman in the kitchen it, it is hard because you have to be better you can't be equal you have to be better than everyone hmm. damn you punched <laughs> yeah it, and so like the nice and the nasty did that depend on the country um you know was it in spain where that was better for some reason that came from no. no that was in anaheim oh okay <laughs> um you know i was living in, in orange county in anaheim area and uh i don't know i was working like two or three stations because somebody didn't show up and it was a crazy service and I wasn't doing something fast enough for him. And so he grabbed me and then I just, my like reflex was just like, get the F off of me. Yeah. Whoa. Um, and I was just like, I was prepared to be fired. I, I walked outside when I, I used to smoke cigarettes because of that job, but like, I went outside, smoked a cigarette, and uh, I didn't get fired. I think he actually respected me after that. But that's what is difficult, is that it takes me punching him in the face for him to be like, oh, I take her seriously. Whoa. Do you think that would have happened to a dude? No. No, yeah. Damn. Yeah, well, there you go. It's funny how, like, it, for at least for me, in my mind, stereotypically, like, when it comes to home cooking, you picture women in the kitchen, but then... Yeah. when it comes to like in a restaurant full you know setting it's guys yeah mm. and they make it this environment where it's hard to be there because uh well it's one <laughs> it's, there's there's layers like i'm not just a woman in the kitchen i'm a gay woman in the kitchen so there's a lot i mean again this isn't everybody but you know there's times where they think that they can talk to you like, you know, what is it called? Locker room talk because you're gay all because you're gay. So you like the same gender. So like, it's okay to say horrible shit, um, but it's not okay. Yep. <laughs> Have you ever called anyone out like at work because yeah. like- Oh yeah. But then again, they knew that I was off limits. They respected me and I was better than them. Ooh. There you go. Yeah, I've worked in, I've worked mostly food service in all of my jobs, I've been, I've been food service. I remember working in Boston, the grossest language in the kitchen, just the worst, worst language, worst behaviors. Like it's crazy the stuff that c kitchen culture in some areas can get away with. <laughs> it's just a bunch of sailors. It's not yes. pirates. And that has like a tiny piece of why I named the company what I named it. Oh, okay, yeah, there you go. I didn't even think of that, ding. It's a little bit of that, it's a little bit of uh, being a woman also and breaking out of that. It's also like, there's many, many, there's many reasons, but um, a lot of people don't, actually you, you asked me the questions. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, that's what, what, how did you come up with the, the, the name? <laughs> let's go and let's get into it. Um, well, a lot of people don't actually know that pirate, a lot of people have this stigma with pirates that, you know, raping and pillaging and all that horrible stuff, which I, you know, yes, that probably happened too, but there was like a good 10 years of pirate history that that's all people know about. But in fact, it was a place for the LGBTQ plus community to go. Mm -hmm. 
and live a, a life on the sea because they were free to live their life the way they wanted to. It was an outlet for them, women especially. Um, and the powers that be at that time didn't want the pirates to live free the way that they were living by basically essentially being entrepreneurs and doing whatever they wanted. So they actually banned them from doing any business on shore. So then they basically started living their lives on the sea 100% and just doing whatever they wanted on their terms. So there, that's a little piece of it. Uh, my grandfather is related to Captain James Cook, which is just crazy too. I know, it's crazy. And he's the one who discovered that sauerkraut was the cure for scurvy. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of similar, there's like a lot of connections. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and then the culinary one. Um, a lot of pirates actually started off as buccaneers, or I think the French term is boucan, which is a barbecuer. And so they would actually smoke meats and preserve foods that the pirates would come in and they would trade for or they would buy mm -hmm. to take on their trips with them. So that they ate preserved foods because you couldn't hold food, fresh food, fresh produce, fresh citrus, anything like that on the ship for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So then the buccaneers decided that they be, wanted to become pirates because it was obviously they could do whatever they wanted. They made more money. So lots of different connections. Wow. So there, that's, that's very cool. So there's a whole um, background to the name and um, nice. And so what, what is your vision for Lady Pirate? Do you think, do you like, would you eventually open like a restaurant or what, what is your vision for the future? Um, right now, yes, on the restaurant, um, but definitely down the line, I think, I don't think I'm ready to jump back into that environment yet. Uh, I'm really into getting the product out there and the education. Mm -hmm. most do, um, because just as kombucha, nobody knew about kombucha five years ago, you know, there's like 20 different kinds of kombucha that you can find on the shelves now yep. um, at the grocery stores. I want that to be for into foods. I would like to be a, you know, day-to-day -day condiment that people are pulling out of the refrigerator and putting on their food. That's what I want. That is, so like, like big grocery stores holding your stuff too? Is that pretty much what? Yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah. You know, I am really into the farmer's market world right now and really supporting those small businesses. Yes, totally. Who are really just like hustling through all this and just making it happen. And I think it's opening a lot of people's eyes who aren't farmer's market vendors uh, or, you know, just small makers of any kind to, to try new things and to support small business. And um, so I, I'm really focused on San Diego area and in California um, and just getting the product out there and eventually, you know, having a lot larger of a product line for people to play with. Mm, I mean, I can definitely see if you keep carrying, if we keep carrying your stuff, I mean, I'll keep keep my fridge full of lady pirate stuff i got kimchi now i mean i'm i really want to try the hot sauce is the hot sauce fermented yeah so it's not super spicy mm -hmm. it's the same heat level as the kimchi which is not spicy it's got like a punch and it's very bold you know it's yeah like ginger so it's like that um but uh like a tapatio you know that's how it kind of comes and you can just pour it on your food you know, I put it in soups. I put it in lots of different things. Mm. Next time I come up there, I'll bring you some. Oh, nice. Um, yes, that'd be amazing. Um, so, um, do you think, so do you think now with COVID, how, do you think it affected the restaurant industry? Like, do you think it's going to affect it permanently from now on? Like, do you think people are going to be dining in often? Like, I mean, I don't know how the virus will look in the future, but I think it really brought, shed some light on like how foodborne illness, it, like how much of a thing it actually is, you know? So do you think it sh it's gonna shift the way the restaurant industry is? Like, is that gonna even be a thing anymore, do you think? Uh, that's a loaded question. I think yeah. that, um, 
well, one, I think it's very ironic that restaurants are the one place that can continuously stay open when the environment in the back of the kitchen, there's, there's no way you can stay six feet apart from somebody. Mm-hmm. There's, no, there's no way that you're not talking to someone right next to you. There's no way that a mask might be coming off because it's a hundred degrees in the kitchen. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's impossible. So it is funny to me that that's okay. But if we keep doing this shutdown, not shut down, shut down, not shut down, I think it's gonna really destroy businesses. And I also think that it's gonna shed light on the businesses that maybe need to rework their concept. Maybe, you know, I think that if you're a small mom and pop place like regulars is, for Mm -hmm. example, sorry, for example, um, you're gonna be fine because it's small enough you can control your costs. You can, you like know what's happening. Mm-hmm. You don't have a 500 seater restaurant that you're trying to fill seats at. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Because that's what's difficult. And I think it's a good thing. I think that those places need to downsize a little bit. I think that it needs to come back to those small restaurants that are really doing a good job and putting out quality, high quality food with local ingredients because that's where it started. It shouldn't be these giant, corporation restaurant groups running everything and buying everything from Cisco that's supposed to be a produce. You know what I mean? Totally. I think that there's going to be good and bad coming out of it, but to say what's going to happen, I don't know because I don't Yeah. 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 Well, I was just thinking, yeah, what your perspective as a chef, like, cause it totally affected every business, but then like, I really realized for me at least my awareness expanded on like foodborne illness is like such a thing. And I, you know, working my whole life in food service, I didn't really realize how much people didn't wash their hands, didn't really, you know, do and in, in that, in that sense, I think it's going to be better yes. because people will have it ingrained that they must wash their hands constantly. They need to change their gloves. You don't wash your gloves. You take them off. Yeah. You change your gloves, you know? <laughs> Um, washing gloves oh my god (laughs) uh, yeah um yeah Yeah. Uh, just today i I think what's going to happen is a lot of cooks are probably going to leave the industry because they can't rely on lowered wages Mm -hmm. when they already need higher wages just to pay their bills you know just like what, seven years ago, I was working two to three jobs in a kitchen. It was either two kitchen jobs plus a catering gig, you know, that I, I always had money coming in. But that hustle isn't really there anymore because they're tired. Yep, yep, They're tired, yep. they're paid, they're not treated well, a lot of them, um, and it sucks. And it, and it comes down to the people at the top, the people running the business, running the restaurant. you got to you have to respect your employees, you know? And if you spend thousands, hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars opening up a restaurant, you can't, you can't take it out on your employees by paying them a crappy wage and then expecting, you know, double the wage worth of work effort. You know what I mean? That, Just, yep. it, there's a lot of layers to, to it, but in terms of COVID and, and foodborne illnesses, I think that they'll probably go down. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. It's yeah. After like in like three years from now, I think we'll uh, definitely adapt to it because it's like it was. It's quite an issue looking back at it now. Like how much people didn't really take care of it, and now we're like extra hyper careful. And I'm like, we should, you know, we should all. And we were always careful before, and now even more. I'm like, this is kind of how it really. <laughs> should have always been you know <laughs> yeah. I, I know what you mean. i know what you mean but the restaurant business too is is like a huge piece of the economy mm-hmm. so many people work in the restaurant business whether it's a full-time job second job whatever so i don't see it going anywhere to yeah. this wouldn't support a lot of people and um i think it might just change totally yeah it just shift completely yeah, and that's funny that you met, that you mentioned like the big thing. I remember I worked in downtown Boston at a restaurant, um, Joe's Bar and Grill. I don't even know if they're still open now, but they 
there was the same Cisco truck. It's funny because it's like all different foods, but it was the same Cisco truck that would go to all the restaurants in the place. And it's just, it's the same food and it's all prepared differently. So I think you're right with like how, and I think it should be like that where the tiny restaurants should get their own specialized food local as local as they can and like have it all be as unique as it can. I really like that regulars is very much like that. Like the lettuce that we get is from like some lady that grows hydroponic lettuce in Ramona. And then we get sprouts from some other place. And then, you know, it's a, it's all really, and I think that it should really be like that. And they, they carry really specialty products like yours. That's like, you know, I think it, all of these should, should definitely be that way instead of like expanding to this corporate it's a corporate thing. Anyways, but yeah, I think that's, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I get you. I, I get it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, do you, um, so with, um, would you carry your, like, would you carry your product? Like if someone, a big company reached out to you, would you like, you know, give your product to them, like sell your product to them? Like a big, big, I don't know. I can't even think of a big restaurant chain. Um, but would you collaborate with a big thing or are you just mostly sticking to small businesses? Well, I've tried selling to restaurants. Um, I think that unless it, they're doing what you guys are doing, it is too high a cost for them. And if you are thinking about having kimchi on your menu as a chef, you should learn how to make your own kimchi. It's just like, you should just do that because you should know how to do that. You know what I mean? For or, sure. yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, it's a business. If, if a big account is like, Hey, you know, here's an order of a million jars. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be working my ass off for the next <laughs> a million jars kimchi, you know, cause I, I want it to get out there. Like that's a good thing. You know, it's when they try and tamper with the product or, you know, down the line, if say someone ever wanted to buy the company, you know, I would, that is where I would really be vetting the company and making sure that it stayed what it was. Yeah, yeah. I don't want, a, I, I want it to stay authentic and high quality and what it is. Totally. Yeah. Oh man. And do you think, in the future, like more, I mean, I feel like there's a big boom with the fermented food stuff. Like, is it, is it going to, do you think it's going to keep going? You know, it's going to keep expanding, expanding like that, like the way it is now, or is it kind of just a trend that um, came back and it, you know, might not stick or whatever? I think it's been around for a long time. I think yeah. it's, around, you know, in terms of people doing it at home since the sixties, seventies, um, but yeah, no, it, it's gaining popularity. Yeah, like in the mainstream, which is crazy. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I like working farmer's markets is because I get immediate information and feedback from consumers. Yeah. Because they'll say, oh, I heard about this. It's good for my gut or it has probiotics, but that's all they know. Mm -hmm. So it allows me to, and every farmer's market's different every which is so interesting because i can go one hour north to orange county and do a farmer's market and they have no idea what kimchi is but i can go to little italy and i don't even need to explain anything someone just beelines for the booth and knows what they want they want the kimchi oh. so there's still a lot of education that needs to happen but there's a couple of businesses that are doing that and we're all in like a different niche which is nice so though if one of them has a little bit more of a following then that's great because they can introduce people to fermented foods they can also do education you know so it's it's growing i think for it's been sure. a couple of years but like it's growing yeah for sure yeah i noticed that because i came from portland and i noticed that too over there it was kind of growing but then when i was in boston i would go to these health food restaurants and stuff there was not because i grew up in boston lived in portland now i live here in different areas you're right it's like some places kind of really know it some places like it's not even there yet at all yeah. so yeah that's really cool um so you, you got guitars behind you do you play instruments as well i do 
Okay, okay. So you're a creative person. You like the culinary arts, music. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Also, I also uh, got into woodworking recently too. So nice. Yeah, I'm. I'm with you there. I'm a creative person as well. I can't seem to. Well, I mean, I can't. I guess I can seem to stick to one thing. There's always been one, music has been consistent throughout my life, but I'm always hopping around um, different art forms. So you do um, music and woodworking and culinary arts. Anything else that you're into creatively? Um, I'm into growing plants. You know, I just yeah. built a, a farm box, um, like a veggie box. So, um, I'm just finishing that up and then I was going to put it out and get it ready for spring. Um, nice. but yeah, I mean, I'm the same way. I've been playing music since I was like six and I just go through phases mm -hmm. of either playing a lot or being really into just doing this right now. This just the one thing right now, you know, woodworking for me is the same feeling as actually all of those, whether it's gardening, woodworking or music, I can get lost in it. So it's nice nice that's that's very cool i am um, yeah music has been a constant and um i've been just hopping around like digital medias video photography all that kind of stuff so it's cool to see a fellow artist so i mean you just you're just an artist in general do you consider yourself an artist um i i suppose yeah i never really think about myself that way um i just kind of think i like to do these creative things and um working in the restaurants for so long having last year to having not done that uh i was able to realize like oh i i want to spend the rest of my life doing the things that i enjoy doing and if i make money at them at the same time maybe in different avenues sure mm -hmm. why not because i'm doing something that i love to do and that's what's really important you know totally i, I chase the uh the money dragon and climb the ladder and uh, I did it in a very short amount of time and um, I just want to live my life and do something good for the world and you know put out good things. Totally yeah um, Imogen Heap I don't, I don't know if you know her as an artist she a quote she said at one time in an interview she said do I do what I love and that's it I'm like for some reason it was so simple I'm like Oh, okay. I, it seems like you're doing that as well. So that's um, amazing. So what um, part does your wife, say that again? I'm just not at her level quite. Oh yet. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> goals. Um, <laughs> what part does your wife play in all this? So she does all of the back end business stuff, basically all the stuff that's not creative. <laughs> um, but I would not be able to do it without her. It's definitely like a 50, 50 thing. I, the business wouldn't be where it, where it is without her at all. Mm -hmm. Um, because I would have just been stuck in my creative, you know, bubble and not known how to get things out a certain way, not know how to sign up for certain things or get certain permits. And, you know, so she definitely is a huge help with that. Um, but yeah, we, we do everything 50, 50, she does all that back end business stuff, and I do all the content and the creative part. Wow, so cool! And she like does the Instagram networking and stuff like that too. Yeah, yeah, she does that. Um, I put out the most of the creative content on Instagram, like all the recipes, the food photos, all that stuff is me. Um, and then we kind of share on the stories and um, other other things like that. But yeah. Oh, so cool that I'm, I'm noticing that that's a common trend of like having success is finding someone that can do the like polar opposite of what you're doing and like kind of yin and yang collaborate like in that there's so many creatives that can't figure it out because <laughs> that's just not what they're good at and that's okay yes totally Find someone that knows what you're doing is a good thing can be something more and knows how to get it there. That's great. That's great advice for whoever's listening. That is dope advice and a good advice for me too. Um, <laughs> dang, that's amazing. So you're, I, I'm 
I've learned more about you than I actually thought I would. This is, you know, this has been really cool. There's a lot of layers to you. And I'm sure your, what was your wife's name again? Leah. Leah. I'm sure there's a bunch of layers to her as well. Um, yeah, this has been a great conversation. I really, really enjoy um, your product. I think it, I'm, I have a feeling that it's going to take off really well. So for someone that's starting like a food product business before we um, end everything, what's your advice to them during this day and age with everything that's happening and they want to start it kind of like how you did right when everything started or where we're at now, we're kind of in the middle of it. What's your advice to them? Make sure it tastes good. <laughs> sure it's the best thing out there. Whatever it is that you're making, if it's pasta sauce and there's a thousand pasta sauces, make sure it's better than every single pasta sauce. And just make sure it's solid before you let someone try it. De that's awesome. That's the best advice ever, <laughs> for sure. Because your product is, I'm not just saying this because you're here. I'm really, when we tried it at the store, I was like, damn, I got to get myself some of this. So yeah, so everyone that's watching, check, so what's your um, website for um, Lady Pirate? So it's ladypirateproducts.com. And on there, you can order delivery uh, throughout San Diego and um and then we ship nationwide also. Um, and we're still working on a little bit of things on the website, uh, but in terms of it being like e-commerce and being able to order, it's all set and ready to go. Um, you can go to Instagram, Lady Pirate Products, follow us. I have recipes on there and just updates on where we're gonna be and just updates in general about the business and where we're going. Awesome. Sweet. So yeah, add them on Instagram. They are always popping. They're always very active on there. So I like tuning into what they're doing. Um, sweet. Thank you so much, Ro, for doing this interview. I'm like pumped about fermented foods now. This is <laughs> awesome. Okay, sweet. Well, thank you everyone for watching. And um, yeah, subscribe to the channel if um, you haven't already. And thank you so much.